So hi everyone and welcome to the fourth Play UK webinar organized by British Council. My name is Ibiza Garic and I will be your host today. Play UK is a festival focused on innovation in games and interaction between art and technology. It is now a digital event, so our exciting mix of content is online and anyone can enjoy it. So along with talks and lectures from our Play UK experts, each month we will be having a live session in which a UK developer uh, will share the, uh, their knowledge and engage with the audience. This time we will be tackling the business side of games as I will be joined by Alistair Hobson who will talk about creating a perfect game patch. But before we get started, a few service information. So this session will run for about 90 minutes and it will be fully interactive and open to your questions throughout its duration. So make sure to write, uh, to write all your questions down in the QA box. The session is being recorded and it will be uploaded to British Council's website and YouTube channel. And also it will be sent to your email in the following days. So with that out of the way, we can start. So our today's guest is Alistair Hobson, head of special projects at Superhot, who will share practical advice on how to land a publishing deal or secure funding for your game. Hi, Alistair, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hey, thank you very much indeed. Uh, I'll just get my slides set up. Uh, that was a beautiful intro. Um, I'm very excited uh, to do this talk. Also incredibly nervous. I've never done an online talk before and I generally don't do much public speaking. So we'll see how we get on. No. Should... OK, I'm sure that it will be great. So <laughs> fingers we can, crossed. Yeah, to make it to make it like easier for you, we can start with you actually telling us a bit about yourself and what you will be sharing with us today. Yeah, of course. So um, essentially, I am nowadays at least a business person. We'll get into more of that in a little minute or two. I used to be a video game designer. And today, what I want to talk a little bit about is pitching video games for fun and for money and to allow you to make awesome, cool, interesting video games. And I'll also be talking a little bit about how to do this in this crazy 2020 COVID world that we're in as well, which is very interesting. Um, so yeah, I think I'll just get started if that's good for you. Yeah, yeah. Just Perfect. The, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Excellent. OK, cool. So the rough outline which we're going to try and follow today is essentially we're going to talk about me for a little bit because it's always exciting for these uh, type of talks. We're going to talk a little bit about an initiative called Superhot Presents because it's to do with money and funding and video games. We're going to talk a little bit about the key terms that I think are useful for people to know when they are in the business of trying to raise money in finance and all that kind of stuff. We'll talk a little bit about what you want to do before pitching, how you want to prepare for it, the timing that you want to do things in because it's a little bit strategic and kind of important, um, the actual pitching process itself and the common pitching pitfalls, uh, which sounds like an awful lot to pack in in 60 minutes and it is over 100 slides. So we'll see how we go on. We'll Matt see how, yeah, how it goes. Yeah, yeah very much so. Um, disclosure just to start off. So although this is quite a chunky talk, it is just an overview. Like this is a huge and crazy topic of how do we make video games? How do we get money for video games? How do we get partners for video games? Um, how do we make it out of the world? Um, this, I intend it to be just a very high level overview with lots of jumping off points. So if you're interested and want to find out more information, you totally can and there's lots of links. Uh, it's also the talk I would like to have heard myself when I started out pitching because I don't have a business background at all and to be honest don't really know what I'm doing and just kind of making it up seems to be going okay so far so that's kind of nice um also disclaimer there is no right or wrong when it comes to a lot of the business and pitching stuff a lot of the time um there are good things to do and bad practices and all the rest of it but one person's idea of a great pitch might be another person's idea of a bad pitch so I just want everybody to keep that in mind and as with all talks, don't trust me. I'm just some guy talking on a screen. Uh, there are many like me. Um, there is lots of good information out there on the internet, which there never used to be, which is fantastic as well. So I implore you to just use this talk as a nice little bit of reference and go out there and do a little bit of research for yourselves. And I, I lie a lot as well and make stuff up. So definitely don't trust me. Thank but, you for all the disclaimers. Thank yeah, <laughs> I, I feel like it's important. I feel like it's important. 
Uh, about me, uh, once upon a time, I started off with hair. I grew up in Scotland. I did a game design degree many years ago in 2003. I was the first student on the first game design course at my university. It was ridiculous and crazy, but we got it done. I ended up actually as a software engineer at a company in Scotland doing an internship on data analytics, which was crazy in hindsight. I used to have C++ for dummies on my desk, uh, which was hilarious. Uh, that didn't last too long. I got offered a job, which was also hilarious, but I managed to somehow end up as a game designer at Rockstar North, which was essentially my dream job. So I spent a couple of years on the Grand Theft Auto franchise, which was super cool. Did a bunch of other secret stuff that never saw the light of day. Um, but I used to do like multiplayer missions, all kinds of fun stuff. It was really good. Uh, I then got the opportunity to go to Amsterdam, which is technically where I am now. Not technically, but actually where I am now. Um, I've been here for 10 years. I was at Guerrilla Games for five, where I worked as a designer on the Killzone franchise, which was a lot of fun. And then on Horizon Zero Dawn, uh, which was also a lot of fun too. And then I left it about five years ago to start my own projects, essentially. Uh, where it starts to become super interesting for this talk. So I went from making super big budget AAA action video games as a game designer to start my little mini indie studio and making a mobile game about pugs. I leave a little ugly uh, dogs that everybody uh, was super into about three years ago. So I made this mobile party game. This was actually the reason I bring it up is because this was the first time I'd ever pitched a game was for this party pugs game. And it was a success, which was crazy. This was published by a TV channel of all people in the UK, Channel 4 Television. It did pretty good. We got great reviews. We got Apple featured, all that kind of stuff. Made absolutely no money at all, uh, but it did get good reviews. Um, but it was a super interesting pitching story, which we'll touch upon a little bit. After this, I then went on to do uh, what I call my pitching years, where I decided that mobile games weren't for me and I was going to try and raise loads of money, millions of dollars to try and make big, fantastic, cool games. Uh, over those two years, I essentially did uh, three different game projects I worked on. Uh, I created four different prototypes with various different people. I pitched these prototypes in about five different countries, I think, in total to all of your Sony's, your Microsoft's, all of your publishers, all the platforms, everyone and anyone at conferences, at events, um, many times. And I really got into pitching and I absolutely loved it. And it's super fascinating for me. Um, technically, infinite fails as well because I never landed a deal. Interestingly enough, I got offered deals, but turned them down because they weren't precisely what I wanted. Some people may have called these deals garbage, but c'est la vie, they got offered, it wasn't going to happen. Um, and then from there, I actually ended up at a company called Superhot. And if you don't know Superhot, it is an innovative first person shooter where time only moves when you do, made in Poland, Wuj, Zin Dobra Poland. I got hired there remarkably as like a business person, which was strange for me. Uh, hopefully my boss doesn't see this. Hello, Tom, if you do. Uh, so I essentially did random acts of business at Superhot for a couple of years. That was say, working with publishers, trying to bring in new money, looking after our arcade business, which was a thing. Various other random acts of business that needed to get done. So that was super cool. Recently, as of like last month, month ago, two months ago, I got promoted, which was super interesting for me as well. So I'm now technically the head of business at Superhot, which is remarkable and also crazy. And I, for the longest time, had in this talk that meme of a dog saying, I have no idea what I'm doing, uh, but I took it out. I thought it was a little bit too much. But yeah, so I now look after at Superhot our business affairs, our kind of like studio strategy from a business point of view, deals, platform holder relationships, publishing relationships, bringing in new money, sales, marketing, huge big bag of stuff at Superhot, which is very exciting and kind of scary. Um, there's a nice picture of Superhot if you've never seen it. Part of what we also do at Superhot is Superhot Presents, which is I think is very relevant to talk about for everybody here today, which is like this kind of crazy, weird indie fund. We'll get onto what fund means in a little minute, um, but it's essentially because Superhot was quite successful uh, and we have made a reasonable number of millions of dollars, which is very cool, we decided to try and give some of that back 
to the video game indie community because hey we're an indie we love indies indies are great we have money we like games let's give indies money to make games that's essentially it in a nutshell we have four games already announced maybe a couple more i'm not super up to date about it we have more in the pipeline and we give small check sizes so like nothing more than maybe 125 150 ish thousand dollars don't quote me on this uh, two teams to go forth and make their crazy little indie games. We try and look for stuff that is on one hand very artistically exciting and interesting, as you may see by some of the pictures in front of you now. We funded uh, Cavalry, which is the game up here with uh, beautiful Renaissance art, Teenage Blob, everybody's favourite frog detective, uh, Andy Brophy and da Andy Brophy down in Australia. Uh, all kinds of stuff and we give them money we don't take any equity which we'll get onto what that means in a little minute we don't take any shares in a company we don't take any board seats uh, we have incredibly friendly terms and we essentially say here's a bunch of money go away have fun and uh, do your utmost at making a fantastic game and we're not a publisher we don't really provide much support and that's essentially what super hot presents is in a nutshell I feel like I've done a bad job of talking about it, but that's essentially it. Uh, the guy at the top is Callum Underwood, business person. He works for Superhot. He does all kinds of scouting for previously Raw Fury, currently Oculus and Carolyn Knights. That goose beside him, uh, we sponsored it and also called it Callum, which is why he's looking a bit peculiar about the whole thing. She's essentially one of the main people behind Superhot Presents. And then Gwen down in the bottom, she is very involved in the day to day, hearing people's pitches and all of that kind of stuff. So if I've said anything wrong, I'm very sorry, Gwen and Kelly. Uh, it, it's awesome. I'm just interested, uh, uh, besides the funding for, for the games, like or, or what else can uh, indie developers working with actually like, pitching for Super Hot Presents expect from you? Like what kind of support do you do you give them and are you somehow involved in in their in their game? Uh, you can expect not a lot and very little involvement. We are not a publisher, so we don't provide quality assurance. We don't provide marketing. We don't provide much at all, if anything. We're very much just, here's your money, uh, go make your game. We kind of do provide a little bit of support, love, platform introduction. So if you want to pitch it to Sony or take it to Microsoft or something like this, we definitely help with all that kind of stuff. But we make no promises essentially on the on the support that we offer. We generally only sign games from small teams, very competent teams, teams that can ship games. Um, and we very much trust the teams themselves to deliver the product and get it out there. Um, as best he can and if we can help along the way we definitely will we want everybody to succeed but we're not going to essentially hold your hand through the process awesome awesome you have also answered like the question of uh, why would someone look for a publisher and what what uh, what a publisher can help uh, an indie developer with perfect yeah we'll get on to that one a little bit more in a minute i'm as sure well. i'm sure um so yeah so to get into the nitty gritties of things pitching money in key terms so pitching my experience, and I'm going to talk super broadly here, like everything in this project and this uh, talk is essentially just presenting your project for money or support to anyone ish kind of um, pitching anything is as old as the hills. It's essentially just like, hey, we've got this lovely thing here. Would you like to be part of it or give us some money for it or some support? Um, I I like to just talk about pitching in very, very broad terms because it's kind of different for everyone and every project and everybody you're pitching to. Um, another interesting thing to talk about as well is that there are many, many, many absolutely crazy, silly terms that are just bonkers when you're in current, when you're encountering them for the first time. So I used to be a game designer. I knew nothing about any of this. Doing a bunch of research, I was like, what the hell is an angel? What is a VC? What is a seed fund? Like, what is a DevRel? Like, none of it makes any sense. Um, for this talk, we don't need to know a lot of these terms. I'm going to kind of lightning go through some of them uh, and basically just talk about the ones that we that are super important for this talk. Um, and yeah, that's an interesting thing as well. This is not a complete list at all. This is just like the highest level sprinkling of things that we need to know. Uh, business versus project. When thinking about going out to get money for your projects or for your business or just money at all to make your video game. 
you can go out there and try and raise money for the business side of it, which is like, hey, we want some money and we want investment into our business, commonly called equity funding, where you give away a percentage of your of, of your company. So it'd be like, this is Dragon's Den, this is um, Shark Tank in America, this is like, hey, can we please have $200,000? You get 20% of our business. Um, that's what that is. Project funding is more, hey, we have this great idea, we have this product, we have this project, and we would like some money to help us take this product or this project to market. Um, business funding generally is very much more suitable for things that are going to be very long term, such as like games as a service type projects, free to play projects, things that's going to be around in a long period of time, or tools, Unity, games engines, all of that kind of stuff is very much the type of thing you'll hear people asking for business and equity funding for. It makes a lot of sense there because the value comes out over many, 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 many years when you finally sell your shares and everybody's rich and happy. Project funding is definitely super applicable for what we're talking about today. And that's essentially, hey, I've got this beautiful indie game and I would love some money to help me release this beautiful indie game. Um, I hope that makes sense. Does that make sense? I feel that it that makes sense. To yeah, Perfect. That's to me. So. Excellent. Um, where you get money from, regardless if it's for business or project, there's a bunch of different places. Um, sweat equity, which I for a long time misread as sweet equity, is very funny. That's essentially, hey, me and my buddies, we're going to work on this business or this project for a few months. And at the end of it, if we decide to formalize it into a proper business, we're all going to own equal numbers of shares. This is essentially saying, hey, we're going to just sweat and work for this business and not earn any money, but we will earn shares in the company. Friends and family money, uh, this is, is normally friends and family is fools, not a huge fan of the term, but essentially, hey, mom, dad, rich uncle, uh, the guy down the street who's a pilot, whatever, would love to give you money to either invest in your business for shares, or they love the idea of your project and they're going to give you money towards the project, or generally grants in government as well. So, hey, government of Poland, we're doing this thing. Can you give us some money? Depending on the country and the jurisdiction, that money might be for your business or it might just be for the creative project as well. Really, for businesses, equity investors, so this is again like the Dragon's Den style of we're going to take a percentage of your business. They give you money, accelerators and incubators. So, hey, we're going to join this program that's going to teach us about business for six months, and in return, we'll own 7% of your business. Generally, accelerators and incubators. Angels is a super interesting one for me, and I love this term. Essentially, just read, means rich person. So, every time you hear angel, just think rich person. They're also called high net worth individuals, which is also think is a nice name for a rich person. So this is, a, hey, we love your uh, business, or I love what you're trying to build, or your philosophy. We're just going to give you some money towards it. That's great. And then venture capitals, uh, capitalists. These are your Anderson and Horowitz, so your London venture partners. And these are essentially businesses, uh, professional investors who have hundreds of millions of dollars and need to invest these into businesses and companies. Um, project based funding. So this is publishers. These are the devolvers, the raw furies of the world who will fund your project because they believe in it and want to see it succeed and think it will make some money. Generally, platforms, Xboxes, Sony's, PlayStation's, Oculus's, manufacturers of gaming consoles or storefronts, I guess technically Epic or something like this, maybe who it's in their interest to see your game succeed and be sold on their platform or showcase for hardware. Crowdfunding, and skim over that a little bit, everybody seems to know about it. Uh, and then funds, which is the interesting kind of new one, whereby Superhot Presents is kind of like a fund because we're not a publisher, uh, but we also don't take any equity and we don't support your technically your business, we don't take any shares. Kowloon Knights would be another type of fund as well that have a similar business model. Uh, that's all super boring. Hopefully it was useful. I won't talk too much more about mm -hmm. it, other than to say publishers is essentially what we're going to talk about today in pitching to publishers. Um, and this is not even a complete overview at all. If you were looking for a complete overview or more in depth on this, there's a really good talk here called Funding What and When by Jason Della Rocca. It's on GDC channels. Uh, go for a little Google and you'll find out loads and loads of information there.
Um, and of all this talk, yeah, as focus on pitching, mostly everything still applies, particularly the stuff coming up about mindsets and the mistakes that people make. Um, but if you are going to try and raise equity funding for your business, then I would definitely look a lot more into that and definitely don't just regurgitate what's here. So mindset and opportunity. <clears throat> this is what really messed me up when I was mm -hmm. thinking about pitching the first times. So raising money, um, and this is essentially what you're doing when you're pitching, is essentially sales kind of. Um, you are selling your game project to people uh, in return for money, support, marketing, PR, whatever it may be. This took me a little while to wrap my head around because coming from like a game designer-ish technical background, I was like sales, used car salesman, that's horrible, I hate the word, it's disgusting, I don't like it, I never want to be that guy, uh, which is very stupid and very raw. Yeah. Uh, it is just like, it is like the, one of the most important parts of I mean, of the game. Like, I mean, the most important part of the game, and yet it is so overlooked. Yeah, very much so. Uh, and also, I think people have a very wrong connotation about what the word sales actually means. Uh, I don't know how best to describe it, but I would very much think of it more of as like, there's a really good book called Getting to Yes, which is nice for this as well, but it's essentially trying to present what you have to people to try and find a nice partner to make something beautiful happen. That's the kind of way I think about sales. And it's not at all, hey, I'm going to try and con you out of this. I'm going to try and uh, force sell you this pen. I'm not going to try and scam you or anything like this. But there is some element of like, hey, we have to present ourselves well. We have to present our game well. Uh, we're still asking for enough money to buy houses and multiple houses and cars. So there is definitely some element of sales in there. Um, will you be will you be uh, sharing on how to how some someone can hone their uh, sales skills and actually how how you did it like during the, those two years like what are the the skills you you found more uh, most useful to yes in, in, yeah. Yes, I went a little about. bit of a start and then definitely at the end we can get into it some more as well. Oh, OK, awesome. Um, I think for, uh, yeah, so for talking about the sales bit in particular, I can't remember where I found this little diagram here, but I've always found it super interesting. So you're looking to say things that are, on one hand, true, uh, and on the other hand, interesting, but also not lies, but kind of, and not boring trash, but also uh, factual and correct. So for an example here, uh, my game's got 10 features. OK, so that's very true, uh, but it's not very interesting my game has the best 10 features that I've ever seen in a game ever, and they are better than any other game in the world. Also lies, not very interesting, but good pitch would be like, hey, we've got 10 features in our game that are absolutely fantastic. We've looked at what the other games I've ever done. We've looked inside ourselves and found what we've really loved to do, and we feel that these 10 features are absolutely fantastic, and that everybody who's playtested them has raved about them. Okay, cool. Now I'm a little bit more interested. Um, Neither a lie, neither boring trash, still true and still interesting. Um, there are many different examples here. We can get into them later on. Um, but the bigger point, I think, here as well, is like when you're looking for a publisher, from a mindset point of view, is it's also like looking for a marriage, which sounds, which for me sounds really strange. I would never look for a marriage. But the idea that you're entering here into generally a long term commitment. It's not a hit and run thing. I've been pitched a lot of people that are just looking for a little for some money and then they plan to just disappear off into the ether and make a video game like that. And if you're dealing with publishers, that's very much not what it is. If you're making like your average energy game, it's going to take what a couple of years to make. If you get a publisher early on, which you probably should, is you're going to be talking every week, every month for these people for like two years. And then the game releases, and then that's another two years. You're talking maybe two, four, five total six years maybe where you'll be dealing with these people in this company that's longer than many marriages last uh, so from like a mindset point of view i think it's very worthwhile thinking about hey we are going to be working with these people for a long time it's a partnership we are better together uh, it's not just a cash grab we're not just here for the money we're here for someone to support us and our vision and our game um and on that as well uh, Pitching is a human process and it's influenced by people, relationships and emotions as well. And we'll talk a little bit more about this later on, but essentially nothing makes sense 
people might like your game, they might not like your game, they might be hungover, they might be grumpy, maybe it's a great fit, maybe it's a not, uh, maybe everybody thinks it's really exciting at the start but then changes their mind later on, maybe something better comes along. There are so many different factors that may decide whether your game is, pitched, is uh, picked up or not. And most of these you can't actually control, um, which is crazy. And I never kind of like internalized this when I went out there pitching. Uh, and that's totally OK. And you just kind of have to live with it. It's like any of these big life changing, business changing events, there's only so much you can do to make it happen. And at the end of the day, it kind of what will be will be. Um, that being said, uh, it's also worthwhile thinking before we get into the kind of nitty gritties that you as an individual and a company and a group of friends making a product is to understand that raising money is often super long. It takes months and months and months sometimes. It can take an afternoon, but it generally can take a long time. It's very hard and very mentally draining, which I don't think enough people talk about. Uh, you're dealing with sums of money and people that can literally change your life or not. Your friends can be in and out of work. Your company can go bankrupt. People can ha, can't struggle to put food on the table and that could be like a very mentally draining thing and definitely something you have to think about before you get started. You're going on a huge journey and an adventure uh, and that's very, it's kind of key. I think it's something I never quite picked up on either. Uh, and then to kind of move things along, never forget that you're presenting people with an opportunity. You are not solving your money problem, uh, which people still pitch me today with things like this, like, hey, we've got uh, two months left in the bank and we really love our game. Could you give us some money? And I'm like, probably not. Like, you'll probably just waste this money like you wasted whatever money came before. Why would I just give you money? Uh, if it came to me like, hey, we've got this absolutely fantastic game. It's a few months away from finish. Play tests were absolutely fantastic and it's amazing. Uh, we're looking for support for marketing, for QA and some business relations to try and get a feature done source. OK, cool. Now I'm listening. Now I'm interesting. It's exactly the same project, uh, but people are talking to me about an opportunity and something exciting rather than, the, hey, we lost our lead engineer. We don't have any money. Um, I don't know, my cat died. Wherever it may be, can you help us fix our problem? Um, and that's never a good thing to do. Also, it's also worth remembering as well, the thing that you have is special and it's great and it's something that you love and it's something that you're very excited about. And you're not just pitching that, but you're also pitching, in my opinion, is like your plan, your vision and definitely not a problem. Whenever the nights were long and things were dark for me, I used to always think about this little tale that a friend of mine told me when he was starting his business and he always thought himself as like part of a pirate ship, despite how crazy that may sound, with his little pirate crew out in this big crazy ocean that always had a destination in mind. Like regardless if that destination was good or bad or whatever, it was important for them. That destination could have been like, hey, we're going to ship a game on a console or we're going to make $5 million or we are going to work as hard as we can and hope for the our best, but we're going to give it all for the next six months or something like this. Um, that was always really reassuring to me uh, before we started going out in the pitching world because you knew what you were after, what you were looking for. You kind of had this mental model that, hey, you guys are all together in this little boat or in this crazy ocean. Things will happen out of your control. All you can do is try your best. Um, you might have guessed that I get a little bit philosophical when I talk about pitching and money and all of that kind of stuff, but hey, I got into it a lot and I uh, really liked it. Uh, the other one that people used to tell me about was like starting a rock band and if somebody came to you and said hey I'm going to get a couple of my buddies together and we're going to start a rock band and we're going to be super successful like how would you react to that? Okay cool follow your dreams excellent would you think they would have a huge chance of success? Probably not will they have a great time doing it? Yes if it becomes successful it will, will be an amazing adventure sure that's the way I kind of think about pitching indie games at this point in time. It's uh, there are so many everywhere, there's so much competition, the market's absolutely crazy, all kinds of things going on in the world. Uh, but if you go out there with a nice mindset, which I did and had a great time, like hey, we're just going to go out and try and start our band, then for me it worked out really well. Um, worth keeping in mind. So uh, I'm going to drink a little bit of this. Yeah, and before doing anything, so before reaching out to a publisher, actually, even before that, like what questions should indie devs ask themselves before deciding whether or not to look for, for a publisher? Yeah, I mean, that's a huge question. Like 
to start from the philosophical angle, because hey, that's what's interesting to me. It's like, are you sure this is something that you really, really, really want to do? Um, I mean, it's a crazy, it's sad, it's strange, it's exciting, it's a scary experience, and it's not for everybody. Um, it's totally legitimate to go out on your own and not self pub and to not publish and self publish. That's totally fine. Like for certain situations, that's the absolute perfect thing to do. So, Super Hot did, Astroneer did it as well, I think. There's countless other examples out there. Um, I think not having a publisher is great. I think also having a publisher can be great too. I think it very much depends on the team, their circumstances, how much buzz or not buzz they have, how experienced they have or have not, how much money they think they need or don't need. It's very much one of these, uh, everything is a shade of grey, there is no right answers. It's very situation dependent, timing dependent and everything else. Um, but I always come back to this like, regardless of which avenue you pick, I feel that it's good to pick it because you feel it's the right one for you, your circumstances and your team, not necessarily what some guy on a chat may say or may not say. Um, you don't need a fucking publisher. It's a great talk, I think, uh, by Nigel at Devolver, which is very relevant to this. Uh, if you are in any doubts, if you think you need a publisher or not, this is a great talk to go and look at. Uh, he also has a really nice disclaimer at the start, which is also, hey, I'm just another bald guy talking on another talk. Uh, take everything I take with a grain of salt. And he's also an indie publisher as well and says don't trust him too. But I still think it's a really interesting talk and a good different reference point to have. Um, but from now on, for the rest of this talk, I'm just going to assume, because hey, time is short and there's lots to get through, that you are a company, regardless if you are or not, you are a group of friends, you have a game idea or a prototype and you're looking for a publisher to give you money and support to help get that game out there and market it. Uh, so preparations for all of that, knowledge is power, research is friend, research is life. Uh, I can't stress enough how important doing your research before you get into going out and talking to people actually is. So research not just what publishers are out there, what your competition is doing, who you might be pitching to, why you might want to be pitching, how much money you might need, all of that kind of stuff. Um, I see lots of pitches come along where people obviously haven't done their research, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as well, uh, but just this idea of it, there's loads of information out there, loads of people to go and talk to, uh, is completely beholden on yourself to do this research, to find it out. There's Gamma Sutra articles, there's Games Industry or Biz articles, there's talks and all of that kind of stuff. And the more informed you are, and the more you know about the people that you might be pitching to, the greater chance of success that you will have when pitching to them uh, all day long, in my opinion. Um, you want to be researching that who are the publishers that are out there. Uh, you might think, hey, Ali, I already know the publishers that are out there. There are the Devolvers the, the and the Raw Furies and the Cool Kids, as I call them. Uh, and they're very good at what we do and they're absolutely great. But there are lots of other publishers out there that might be way more suitable for your game. If you're making a simulator type game like farming simulator or job, not job simulator, but uh, farming or train or truck or lorry, or whatever it may be, hey, there's publishers that specialize in those type of games and that's totally who you should be pitching. If you came and pitched to Superhot Presents, uh, you're going to do, I don't know, laundry simulator. I'm looking at my laundry just here. Uh, but we'd be like, unless this is a crazy pop culture weirdo out there game, uh, we're probably not going to be down for that because we know absolutely nothing about simulation games. Likewise, if you go and try and pitch uh, a free to play um, match free game to Paradox, who love grand strategy games, not going to work out. Haven't done your research. Everybody is sad and uh, bad times all around. Um, and my overarching point here as well, for your particular niche or your particular genre, there might be game publishers out there you might not necessarily be 100% aware of that could be fantastic for you. Uh, so definitely do your research here. When you're looking at different publishers, try and check that they have done similar games or not, but at least doing the type, roughly, vaguely speaking, of games that you might be interested in uh, making for them. But the budgets somewhat match. Budgets is a crazy big topic as well. We'll get into it a little bit, but hey, if you're looking for five million dollars and generally they only fund up to 250 or 500 or something like this, then there's definitely a mismatch. How you find that out is part of your research and doing lots of Googling and Twittering and asking people and all that kind of stuff, but hey, it's important to do. Uh, it's also interesting to find out what do they offer. Um, so is it just 
hey, we are going to recruit an outside marketing agency, an outside QA house, and let them handle it all, and you kind of can deal with the nitty gritties, or is it, hey, we're going to do as much for you as possible, we're going to do it in house, we're going to do it with loads of care and love. Uh, is it just marketing you're getting? Like, just because they are a publisher um, doesn't mean that all publishers are equal. And uh, yeah, finally, reputable. Are these people that are going to be in charge of your life's work reputable, good, honest, trustworthy people? Uh, you can't Google this one. You basically just have to talk to a bunch of people, uh, look at the games this publisher has made and published, find out who worked on those games, and then just phone them up and ask them. I've had people come and ask me about publishers I've worked in the past. It's totally a thing. Uh, it's totally worth your time doing as well. And essentially, what you're looking for after all of this is to find a bunch of publishers that you think you'd be a great fit with, that have a bright budget range and a solid reputation. Um, you also want to, while you're doing this research phase, in my opinion, is to have a think about who your competitors might be. Competitors is a weird word for the video games industry, and especially indies. Um, but I think it's worthwhile if you're doing like, a, let's say you're doing a strategy game, what other strategy games have been made and released that are of a similar budget-ish level that you might have? Team size is an interesting one. Try and find out like, hey, that strategy game that you absolutely love and want to uh, pay homage to or release a similar game like, was that five people? Was that 50 people? Was that 100 people? Uh, and also try and figure out what their sales were like and what their revenue were like. So when you're talking to the publishers, you have realistic expectations of what you want, what you need, and then what you can expect from them as well. Um, you might be asking, Ali, uh, where do we find out all of this information? Uh, because there's lots of things to find out or know there. I would totally recommend this Gamma Sutra article. Um, I can share it later afterwards or just email me. There'll be links at the end. Uh, is your indie game ready for funding? Uh, so Cassie does a great job here. It's a fantastic article. Uh, I like it a lot. Um, and we'll talk about a little bit of budgets mm -hmm. later on, sorry. Uh, timing is an interesting one as well. Okay, so cool, so you've done all your research. You're like, okay, well, maybe Venice is the time to go and actually pitch on people. Um, the common mistakes people make when thinking about timing over pitches is they'll do it too soon, as in they don't really have a company or a game or a plan. They will just be like, hey, we've got this great idea for a game. It involves magnets. Do you want to give us some money? Uh, I've actually had that pitch. It's like, no, you don't have... A, you don't have anything uh, or it's too late, which is a common one as well. Like, hey, we're two months for shipping. Uh, do you want to be a publisher? Not really. Uh, that ship has sailed. We can't do much for you now. My humble opinion, the best time is generally is when you have a nice prototype. We'll get onto prototypes as well. Uh, but when you have like a solid idea of the game, what it's going to be like, how it's going to play, who's going to make it, how long it's going to take, all of that kind of stuff is a great time to start thinking about pitching. Um, Early access is an interesting one. It depends on the publisher you ask. Generally, it's seen as a little bit of a no-no as far as I can understand it, specifically because all of the cool stuff that like a lot of publishers do can't be done when your game's already out in early access. So it already has like a name and a brand and fans and features, and you've already started marketing it and all of that kind of stuff. So it kind of depends, but generally early access, not so much. Uh, okay, cool. So the time is right. You've done your research. You know what you want. All is good in the world. Uh, what actual things do you need when you go out to pitch? Uh, so a playable build, sure. A pitch deck, which are fascinating. Uh, gifts and video and a lot of luck. I'm not even going to bother talking about gifts and videos because, hey, everybody loves gifts and videos. And luck is basically unknowable. Uh, I'm very much driven by the first two, which is your playable build mm -hmm. and your pitch deck. <clears throat> so those are the most the two most important things an indie has to has to have when preparing the, the, their pitch. I would say so. I would also caveat this as well with pitch deck being slightly less important, uh, but still important. Um, people will sign games without a pitch deck. Uh, pitch deck is essentially just a presentation, uh, but indie games for indie game publishers nowadays without a playable build uh, that people can sit down and have a little go with and see how fun and cool your game is, it's a much harder thing. If you are the lead designer of Fortnite, if you are the game director of God of War, if you are Kojima, you can just rock up and be like, hey, drop me a bag of cash, I'll make you a game. 
no problems. If you are your average indie dev, that ship has sailed. Um, playable builds, very much so, very important. Um, the thing with playable builds though, uh, they are a huge and controversial topic um, and everybody I've spoken to has a different idea of what constitutes a build, what constitutes a prototype, what stage it should be. Uh, people will talk about a vertical slice, which is like all of your main features and some art that showcases one particular slice from top to bottom of what your game will be. Some people are super happy with um, something that feels great to play. If it doesn't have art, that's fine. You could just have some beautiful concepts. Uh, if it's a systems driven game, you might have a different prototype versus a narrative driven game and they have to showcase different things. My feeling on this don't quote me on it, please, is that you should try and have your playable prototype as whatever you think showcases what makes your game great uh, and is also fun, if at all possible. So back to the pirate ship example at the start, if you're like, hey, we are going to make absolutely fantastic, innovative, uh, beat em up Street Fighter style games, uh, ideally your showcase and your prototype shows what makes your game stand out in that genre, what makes them really cool and exciting, and what makes them fun. Uh, it's, it's, yeah, it's a crazy big, I can try to think what else to say about it. It's so complicated and it's so big and it's so deep. This is one of these things you want to do some research, but yeah, fundamentally you want to put something down in front of someone and when they pick up and play it and they go, hey, I understand what your game's about, I think it's fun and I see that you can deliver the final product based on this. Um, pitch deck, also hugely controversial topic. Uh, there are people who have built entire careers just out of making per perfect decks, which is hilarious to me. Um, they are essentially just a presentation that you will sit down during a pitch, traditionally, not always, where at the end of it, the person will be excited by your game, know about you, know about your team, know how much you're looking for. They generally follow a similar pattern of an introduction. It's like, hey, this is who we are. Uh, hey, this is our game. This is who's going to make it. This is how much money it's going to cost. Hopefully this is a timeline of when we can do it. Maybe there's some competitor stuff in there. And then fundamentally an ask as well. Hey, we would love to get, we, we think, around $250,000 to release this game uh, with marketing and PR support and things like this. Um, pitch decks are crazy. I love pitch decks. I could go and talk about them all day. I think they're fascinating. Um, if you've never seen one before or you want an example, so this is Gwen. So Gwen is the lady who helps us with Super Hot Presents. She's generally fantastic. Uh, if you go and dig through her Twitter, I know this is very awkward and I'm sorry, but I forgot to put a link here. Uh, she has a pitch deck of which she likes for super hot presents so if you think you have a bit of a crazy game and you think super hot presents might be a good fit uh troll for her twitter i'm sorry uh email me afterwards if you want a direct link uh and she has a lovely example of what people might expect and a pitch deck uh, i would say that different publishers expect different things different people have different preferences um, when i was pitching i always had much more success about putting the game at the very start before, for example, the team or the budget or anything like this, because in my opinion, the game is the most exciting thing. And I like it when people pitch me and they have the game first because it's like, hey, that's what I really care about. And then you back that up with the cool people that's going to make it. But there are different publishers and different people out there who prefer different things. And this goes back to the everything's shades of grey and everything's kind of a noble. All you can do is your best. There are no right and wrongs here. Awesome. Just a, just a quick PSA for all attendees. Uh, we'll make sure to uh, get all the links of the articles and the tweets from Alistair yes. and we will uh, share them in the email all of all of you will get along with uh, the recording of today's session. Definitely. Okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm a very bad and naughty presenter for not doing this uh, and I have ashamed not, and it's very not, it's all my not a problem. We, we, we have found a solution to that. So excellent. Yeah. Um, other thing, just talking about slides briefly, uh, so for 2020, you have to make sure your slides are very easily to read during a Zoom call. Uh, I have had many people present me with beautiful slide decks uh, that look fantastic, that have very tiny text or very slim text, uh, that looks perfect when you're viewing it on a 4K TV screen, but when it's all bunched up on a Google Hangout, it's absolutely atrocious. So if you are in the world of pitching online, which we're going to talk about as well, Definitely try and make sure you use lots of big text and very bold colors and all of the rest of it. Um, and another interesting point here is when you're talking about pitch decks, um, 
it's good to know as well that you're you want to make it easy for other people to present your game and fall in love with it as well because although you are pitching it to one person or a couple of people um they're going to have to go and share that with our team and again we're going to talk about this more uh, but you want this document to be the nice concise artifact that you can give to people at the end of it will be like man that sounds amazing and really cool and we're super excited about it maybe add some gifts in there uh it's got some beautiful art it's very clear and at the end of it people should be able to i know all about this game and i love it or i don't and ex we know exactly what we're going to do with it uh, there's examples out there if you want to go looking for them so you might see something like this from devolver um i'm going to call the game gris i don't think it's actually called gris i always get confused it might be french i don't know um i'm always waiting for somebody else to say yeah that. me too me too it's very awkward i've had this call like four times this week where people are like is it chris we don't know anyway beautiful game lovely platformer again this is a twitter thread uh devolver talk about what they loved about their pitch which i think is super fascinating uh, there's loads of people who talk about pitch decks and pitching video games now so there's definitely lots of research out there uh, this one in particular is really fun though um and you may be saying, I, I don't know anything about budgets. I don't know how to know how much my game is going to cost or how we are going to find all these people or any of this kind of business hoo-ha. Luckily, there are two books nowadays, which are great introductions to all this kind of stuff. The Game Dev Business Handbook, which covers a lot of what we were talking about at the start. And the Game Dev Budgeting Handbook, which is also really good to have as well. Um, and again, for these kind of things, there's no exact science different games cost different amount of monies in different parts of the world so there's no necessarily right and wrong uh, there's definitely good and bad asking for ridiculous budgets and all the rest of it but i think these are great starting points if you're looking to find out more um, and even once you've done all of that kind of stuff there's a really good talk here which is essentially so you're ready to pitch to a publisher uh, you're not by rebecca uh, i wholeheartedly recommend watching this as well and this will give you even more information about what you might expect, what you should have in your pitch deck, um, the journey that you're about to go on, and all of that kind of stuff as well. Um, okay, cool. So now we're getting to the actual pitching process, and we've got like way over already. So it's very much a process. Uh, there's the initial contact, there's the meeting, and the actual pitch, and then a follow up. Um, I love all of this. Well. This is the part we all have been waiting for. Yeah, I know. I wish I'd put it earlier and not talk so much uh, rubbish at the start. Yeah, uh, yeah my bad. Uh, so this is the, basically the initial outreach and the contact. So it's usually an email or a Twitter message or something like this. And again, it's ideally to a person's actual email because, hey, this is a human business. Uh, these emails are definitely out there. They're generally on the internet, on people's Twitters. They're not so much hard to find anymore, but you've done your research because you're clever, so you kind of already know this. Um, what do you put in the email? Well, luckily, Callum, who we spoke about apart, uh, is fantastic and has already done a talk on this, which we'll link, but essentially, the perfect email. Uh, hey, Callum, a little bit about who you are and a link to your company. Like, hey, we are uh, Ali Games, and this is our website. Uh, some more context and link to your projects. We've made four games before. Um, our last game was fantastic and got featured in Edge. OK, cool. Uh, we are now pitching our new game. Uh, let's see. We're a game about barbecuing. Uh, we are a team of five. We're very excited about it. It's called Barbecue Fantastic. Here's a link to the video. It's been absolutely phenomenal in playtest. Everybody loves it. If you would like to play it, who you can get it just now. Here's a GIF of people barbecuing, GIF showing it looks hilarious to barbecue. It's like surgeon simulator, you're skewering bits of chicken and all kinds of stuff. It's great. Uh, the game's a super casual party game. Everybody seems to love it. Uh, it's barbecue meets surgeon simulator. Uh, people think it's fantastic. Uh, budget wise, we're looking for 250. Um, we need marketing, we need QA, and we need someone to save it for ourselves because we don't really know what we're doing because we're making a barbecuing game. Uh, we want to release it everywhere, but we'd be happy just releasing it PC first. Uh, thanks. Are you interested? What should we do from here? That's essentially it. Uh, there's nothing more to it. Uh, you want to have a link to your ideal playable demo already in here. You generally don't want to ask people if you can pitch them because that puts a barrier between you and them. You want to get to it straight away. Um, also, so it's, it's good. Yeah, in, in the email. So it's always good like to, to show uh, an overview of how big your team is, team is the timeline and to show the, the, the person you're pitching to that you already have like a, a business plan uh, 
yeah ahead, ahead of you so make sure to put all that in the email guys definitely like this goes back to the you're in the kind of slightly in the business of sales here and you want to make sure that you're not giving people a reason to say no because you've done something wrong you want to give them a reason to say no because it's not going to be a good partnership uh if you're a team of like 50 people and you need two million dollars and you're pitching super hot presents then i can look at this and i'll be like well one they're probably idiots because they've not done their research but also this is completely not for us and we can end the conversation now and save everybody's time but if this does look like something that will be good for whoever you're pitching to they already have plenty of information to get started they're already excited they've got a gif they can play it it's basically literally the perfect email um mm -hmm. the talk that this comes from or the slides that i stole this from is uh the ndb tips from publishers on how to pitch them uh which is absolutely fantastic and there's got loads of information on there and we'll find it later awesome yeah okay yeah so so hopefully you get a reply <laughs> uh which is also absolutely frustrating and issues to wind me up no end so you send this beautiful email you've done all this work you've done all your research uh and no one says anything yeah what uh, happens uh, when you don't get a reply what do you do then uh then i would send one more after like a week or 10 days or something like this and just be very polite and be like oh hey let's just assume we're pitching callum because it's always fun hey callum uh we sent the stuff. I think it's be. I think it'd be good for your fit. Uh, if you get a chance to look at it, that'd be great. No worries at all if not. Like the ninja level, great thing to do here is if there's been any cool developments in your game since the last email, drop them in there. Oh, since the last email, we were featured in Edge. Uh, we blew up in Reddit. Something like this. Or we're talking to other publishers. Oh, well, maybe, maybe not. But the idea is like if you can show there's been movement, progress, increasing hype, something about your game, also good to drop it in uh once is enough in my opinion maybe twice if there's a, a reason to uh, but if people aren't getting back to you mm -hmm. could be for a number of reasons we're going to talk about that as well if we have time uh, don't nag there's nothing worse than people like have you seen it yet have you seen it yet uh, mm -hmm. or the worst ones are like oh we put some tracking in the pitch and we saw that you looked at our decks and you haven't replied to our emails oh, i don't good. have time for that no one has time for that um Generally, yeah. at least at Superhot, we always try to reply eventually. We don't always get around to it, but like I don't think uh, we've ever not replied. We've always tried to reply, uh, but not everybody does that, and it's just a fact of life, sadly. Uh, okay. It's also super frustrating on both sides of the table. Uh, okay, so, cool. Just a, just a, another question uh, regarding the the email. So. Uh, regarding like the, the time you need to to reply like sh can the indie devs expect uh, that they will get a, a yes or a no from you in the next i don't know a month or two or three months like oh that's a good question so sometimes it can be incredibly quickly how um, usually yeah uh, yeah how fast are you in in replying uh, me personally, sometimes like instantly, uh, especially, and this is bad to say, if it's a very obvious not going to be a fit for support presents, it's basically a no straight away, a very polite and with some reasons, but generally no very quickly. If it's very exciting and super cool, I'll be like, hey, this looks great. Let me chat it over with my team. I'll generally try and do that very quickly. If it's awkwardly, maybe, maybe not. I'm not too sure. I think it's kind of cool, but I don't know. Then it can take like a week. Maybe, I guess, for us. Um, again, this is generally a Gwen and a Callum thing. It depends how busy people are. It depends if you've got the time to see it. Um, but we try and be pretty quick. I have had publishers that will, when I was pitching, would reply after four weeks. They'd be like, this looks great. Set up a meeting. Very rare. Generally, once it's past two weeks, you've not heard a reply. You've asked them again. Then my gut feeling is generally is that ship has sailed. So. Okay, so so indie devs should at least wait for a week or up to yeah. four weeks until sending the the follow-up yeah my gut feeling is if it's been a week and they haven't got back to you then that's that's safe follow-up territory um if it's been a day definitely not you don't want to look too eager either because hey you're presenting an opportunity and you've got this really cool thing that they really need otherwise they're going to go out of business so uh if they don't want it like you don't want to seem desperate either uh so I, that's the way i always looked at it as well so like a week fine two weeks fine uh following up after a day probably not uh, that would be bad. 
Um, oh, all right. This is, yeah, it, it's a lot like dating. Like the the most important thing is like don't be desperate. Yeah, a little bit. Um, yeah, it goes back to the marriage thing at the start. Yeah, uh, the marriage like, thing. I need a girlfriend. <laughs> oh, I don't want to date you. Like, oh, it'd be horrible. Uh, yeah, you don't want you don't want to ever be that team. Uh, it never works out. It never works out. Um, yeah. Okay. Cool. So meeting, pitching on life and real life. Uh, worth noting as well, the pitching is a skill uh, and it needs to be practiced. It's good to pitch on like real people, and by real people, I mean not video game nerds like mm -hmm. us, like your mum, the guy down the shop, a friend of a friend, because you want to be confident and comfortable talking about your game at a very high level. Um, because maybe the person you're pitching to doesn't actually know much about your genre. Uh, they don't really know what makes it exciting. So you want to be comfortable talking about why your barbecue game is absolutely fantastic or your combat or whatever it is. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, practice, uh, practice, practice, practice uh, to yourself and the mirror to anyone. Uh, it's invaluable. Uh, for me also, it's worth noting as well that pitch training is totally a thing and it really helped me. I was lucky enough to go on some pitch training at BAFTA in London and that was absolutely fantastic and it helped mm -hmm. me no end because not a great public speaker, not really that confident standing up in front of people, generally not very good at sales, being Scottish, uh, where everything is bad and nothing is good and it's going to rain all the time. So my overarching point here is as well, it's a skill, you can't get better at it and there are ways to train at it and people to help you get there. I think it's very worthwhile. Mm -hmm. That being said, you're going to sit down, you're going to jump on a call, you'll have your butterflies, it's going to be very nervous, you're not quite sure how to proceed. Um, like this has been my go to line and I love it when people say this to me. So you're sitting like, hi, how are you doing? Great, great, great. Lovely day. Yeah, this conference is horrible. Uh, whatever the little chit chat is, then there's a little awkward pause. And um, because you're on your voyage, you've got your pirate ship, you've got your opportunity. Like I like to try and take the lead a little bit and I like it when the people pitching try and take the lead a little bit. This line I always found works great. It's like, hey, like uh, I'd like to find more about you as a publisher and a company maybe what you're looking for, and also to show you our project. How would you like to start? This is, for me, works really well for a couple of different reasons, because hey, you might run into a publisher that hates pitch decks and doesn't want to see them. It's happened to me. Uh, you might find a publisher that likes to talk about them, them themselves first, which is great because you find out loads of information when they spill the beans about what we're looking for, which is good to know as well. Uh, or everybody like, no, like, I've heard about your game. I saw it on Twitter. Show me it now. It's great. Uh, so if you're never sure how to start a conversation or you're ready to pitch and it's just kind of getting off, it's a little bit nervous. Having this in the bag, I think, has always worked well for me. And I love it when people use something like this as well, because uh, it lets you kind of figure out the flow of a conversation and all of that kind of stuff. So yeah, tell me about yourself and I would like to show you what I've got. Works every time. Um, aim to pitch for 50% of your lot of time, especially online. So if somebody's giving you half an hour for a pitch, aim to talk about your game and give the pitch for 15 minutes max. If it's 20 minutes, 10 minutes max. Uh, if you go on too long and waffle, then people get bored. You might make mistakes. You'll trip up. Uh, you want to keep it short, snappy and sweet and great and very focused. If you want to leave time for questions at the end, which is very, very, very important. You don't want to talk right up to the very last minute and then the timer runs out and you've got to move somewhere else and talk to someone else. Uh, you want to have a nice flow to the conversation and let people, if you have questions, stop, interrupt, wrap up at the end, talk about next steps and all of that kind of stuff. Plus, there's also a nice chit chat at the start about wives and kids and boyfriends and girlfriends and the weather and all that kind of stuff. So you don't want to rush it. You want to take your time. You've got this, especially online as well, because things break constantly. Um, during pitch as well, uh, also fantastic to state what you want. I've had many pitches that are like, yeah, we're making this cool game about magnets. Uh, it's going to be really fun. And then basically nothing. And I'll be like, OK, this is just cool. So thanks for telling me that. Do you want something? And you've got to try and tease it out from the other side about exactly what it is we're looking for and what we want. Um, you guys are like, guys and girls out there are like, very business people, you give us an amazing opportunity. Like, hey, like, we're going to release this. Uh, we'd love a publisher to help us. And we think we need about $250,000. Like, you should never be afraid of talking about money and asking exactly what you need. Uh, because, hey, you're highly competent, very well trained, very well researched, business salesy type people. Um, 
and you've got this and you know exactly what you need and you know that that's the per person to help get you where you want to be. Um, and there's nothing more awkward than a pitch call when people just don't tell you what they want. It's, it's, why are we here? Come on, tell me, tell me, I need to know. Um, and also worthwhile noting as well uh, that the boss person or the person in charge is not always necessarily the best person to pitch in. This is totally fine. Um, it's a mistake if uh, you feel that because you are in charge of it, you need to be pitching. There might be people in your company that are more charismatic, fine, that are better talkers, fine, that are under stress, uh, probably speaking a little bit better, that's all good. If you're worried about it, really, both of you go along and both of you are on the call and all that kind of stuff. But it's worth keeping in mind this as well. Um, and an interesting one that worked well for me is like it can be OK to ask the publisher uh, what we're looking for, what our budgets are, uh, all that kind of stuff. Publishers are probably going to hate me after this, but as long as you're clear in advance when you're setting up the meeting and the call, especially on these online meeting platforms, saying like, oh, hey, Raw Fury, uh, we're starting a new studio and I'd love to chat to you about our, like to find out about what type of projects you're interested in so we can better plan and maybe catch up later. Great, maybe we'll take the call, maybe we'll tell you about Raw Fury and what we're interested in. Um, maybe we won't, it's fine, but as long as you're clear beforehand that, hey, you're just looking to chat and find out more about them, that's great. Also establishes a relationship, you find out more information. Then when you have got something, you can hit them up in four months time or six months time and be like, oh, hey, we chatted six months ago. We've made this thing. I think it'd be a good fit for you. Do you want to do you want to talk about it? It's like perfect. Mm -hmm. um, how to pitch a game It's a talk by mode seven. Um, again, it's really good. He goes into much more detail than I am. Again, this is very broad and high level, but I feel like I've hit the high level points here. Uh, this is a great talk very much think you should check it out. Now uh, we also do we'll really make sure to things. link it. Yeah. yeah. Can you, has, the, has the COVID-19 situation uh, somehow affected or maybe changed the, the, the pitching process at the moment? Do you have any advice for indies how they can adjust to, to these new settings? A little bit, some coming up on that as well. Um, generally, the biggest change I've seen personally from my side of the table is that there are online pitching events rather than in-person pitching events. Most of everything I've said here also still applies, apart from a couple of bits coming up. Uh, you still have to be professional, you still have to sell your game well, you still have to know your stuff, you still have to do your research. The only real change at the moment is, for indie devs at least, is the online side of things, which because it's 2020 and everybody's smart, we've generally got it all figured out now, which is kind of good. Uh, I haven't personally been involved with any deals that have signed just because they've or I haven't been involved in any deals that have been signed when everything's been done online. But I know of some that have happened. Uh, if you had to ask me if it has slowed down the number of games that have signed, probably will that change over time? Yeah, my gut feeling is it will generally get back to normal. Um, because hey, people need to sign games, we need to ship games and all of that kind of stuff. But again, this is just my two cents. Uh, I would very much think that the indie games are still being signed, especially with like smaller indie budgets, because sure, it's fine. If you're trying to raise $10 million for your new studio, uh, giving 10 million bucks to someone that you've never actually met in person, I imagine is a much harder ask. Um, and now that people are traveling, I would not surprise me if face-to-face -face meetings are still required for that kind of stuff. But okay. I don't have $10 million, so I wouldn't know. Uh, okay, girls, you've done all your pitching stuff, you've done a good pitch, you've talked about following up and all that kind of stuff. Uh, how does that work? Well, maybe we'll come back to you and say, hey, we're interested. All is very exciting. Uh, it might happen at the first meeting. It happened to me once and I jump about Oxford Street in London because I thought I was going to get millions of dollars and it was all very exciting. Um, they might send you an email. Maybe we'll say in the meeting, maybe we'll say afterwards that, hey, we're interested. It's never a yes, definitely. And there's a whole process that happens afterwards, which is super interesting to know about as well. So you pitched a single person or a couple of people. You didn't pitch the entire publisher or all of the key decision makers. Um, there is a whole process again stolen from Callum. This was for Roy Fury. This is not my work, but hey, I think it's super relevant to know about. So we've been talking about the stuff that happens before this building budget slide. So we're talking about, hey, just the pitch. You've done the pitch, people like it. What happens next? Well, once they've got the build and the budget, they'll play it themselves, send it around, they'll play it with other people. 
OK, then if it passes that and people are still excited, then we'll look more into the team, the scope, the finances and the nitty gritty of the pitch to see what was true and what was false and if it's all sensible. Then if it passes that, then the wider team at the publisher might play. Uh, people can still veto it or not. Maybe it's democracy, it changes in different publishers. Then there's due diligence to make sure, hey, your company is not like currently under investigation for fraud and all of this kind of stuff. There's more face to face meetings. Then maybe you'll get to the contracts and the cuddles, as people call it, where everybody's all friends, you're going to sign the deal and all of that kind of stuff. So just because you pitched someone and they were excited, that's like the start of the scary process stuff. That's not even the beginning of it. Um, and it can fall down at any one of these different hurdles. And all of these different hurdles are different for each publisher. Uh, nobody does it the same. This is generally a rough, rough overview, but the key takeaway here as well is just because somebody said yes or we're interested in a pitch doesn't mean that, that will necessarily um, relate to something that will actually get signed and it can fall down in any one number of interesting ways. Um, but assuming it goes well, you'll start talking about contracts and terms, which is fascinating and I love it, uh, but we're not going to talk about it today. Uh, because you need a law degree or not, and it's very long and complicated and very exciting. However, once again, I have found the perfect talk. Once again, it's from Callum. Uh, the talk is called uh, Money Really Good Sometime. Let's talk about it. Uh, and here he does a very great job of breaking down the type of terms and deals you'll essentially see as a publisher. Yes. Okay, yes, because we have, we've had a question from uh, one of the entities, attendees about uh, protecting your project from investors and them taking up uh, huge percents of, um, uh, of of the revenue but uh, I'm guessing that you can all watch some uh, talks by Callum or yeah and also we will make sure to include Callum's presentation from Play UK uh, 2020 in January where he has also tackled these topics. Yeah, um, yeah. yeah like to touch a little bit upon that person's question, as I understand it, as in uh, how do you make sure you're getting a fair deal and good revenue percentages, as I understood it? Yes. I've got a caveat always, it's like, please talk to a lawyer and don't, don't listen to me. But essentially what you want to try to do is make sure that if you're having business investment and you're early on in the company that you're not giving away lots and lots of equity because it makes it much harder to get more investment in the future. Uh, so you don't want to give away 30% of your company, even 20% of your company at the start. You want to try and keep as much as possible for yourself. Uh, and from a publishing point of view, that's where it gets kind of interesting as well because not all people look at the headline terms. Oh, we're going to get to keep 70%. They're going to take 30. Oh, we're going to keep 50%. They're going to take 50. Um, it's an interesting one as well. People will complain a lot about the lower percentages, but if you're getting a lot in return, it might not be a necessarily bad thing. If you're going to provide all of the services for you, then hey, maybe 50-50 and you need the help and you need these services and you want this partner, then maybe it's fine. If you're not providing all of that kind of stuff and taking half of all your money, generally a bad idea. Uh, just because they're only going to take fair percent doesn't necessarily mean it's good either. So there's a lot of devil in the detail kind of work here as well. Mm -hmm. Also to do with recoups as well, about when they get their money back, who gets their money back first, all of that kind of stuff. Um, generally, it's a very complicated topic. Um, mm -hmm. Like, yeah, maybe have, we should maybe we should schedule another Play UK webinar just just about that. <laughs> oh, definitely, definitely. It's it's very interesting. But essentially, the nutshell is you want to try and keep as much control as possible, and you want to make sure that you're not giving away huge amounts of revenue for nothing in return as well. The Super Hot Presents contract, actually, that's an interesting one. Um, again, Callum, of linked to this one too, did a Twitch talk. Is that even what we're called? Twitch stream, I guess, uh, where he went through the Super Hot Presents contract, and it is the most friendly contract in the world, where we take 30% of your money up for, I think it is, a max fixed period of time, which is also super friendly, so like, let's say three years. Then after that, you get to keep all of your money, when the game starts earning money, we both take our percentages at the same time. It's not like we don't give you any money until we vend our money back. We don't take any IP, uh, so the property or your intellectual rights to the game. We don't own the game. You don't take any equity. We don't take a board seat. We take absolutely nothing. So that would be super interesting for people interested in this kind of stuff to look at as an example of one contract that is incredibly friendly. Um, uh, it's also stupidly friendly. I can't believe it's so friendly. It's fantastic. I love it. Um, but that might be a good thing to look at, I think, as well. 
Just another a question, yeah, regarding yeah. To, to pitching. Since you said like you're pitching to a person, not to a publisher or some gray entity. Uh, so that connection between two sides is rather important, would you say? Very. So uh, what if somebody has a, a great game? You know that their game is great, but they simply don't instill trust in you. And also as a publisher, what do you do? Like, what do you do to gain uh, the, the, the trust of, uh, of the person sitting uh, sitting on the opposite opposite side? Oh, that's an interesting during one. That, yeah, during that, that, that first, first conversation. So how would I, as like somebody with the money, show that I'm a trustworthy individual or the other way yes. around? Okay, uh, so. Actually, both ways. I'm interested in, yeah, how would you show, show uh, uh, try to get, gain the, their trust? And yeah. my other question is like, okay, they, they have a great game. You know that you have a great project ahead of you, mm -hmm. but the person pitching it, simply something is off. Would you be, would, would you be willing to take a risk? Like, what would you do in those types of situations? Um, so the, for the first one, how I would try and convince people that we are good and trustworthy and all of that kind of stuff, um, generally by being honest um, and truthful uh, and authentic, to use a nice term for it, I think. We can point to our contracts because it's online. We're happy to share it generally with people that we're interested in. People can come and talk to any of the people that we've worked with. Um, I generally feel that we've got like a nice friendly reputation within the industry. Uh, lots of stuff like that, I think, essentially. There's no one silver bullet there. I think there's just that, hey, we're nice people to work with, in my humble opinion. Uh, talk to the people we've worked with and let them speak on our behalf. That's generally how I would look at it. Interestingly, it's not really came up, so I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but hey, from the, if uh, somebody was pitching me a game and I didn't get a good vibe from them, that's an interesting one. So, I'm always of a trust your gut kind of reaction when it comes to people, and if you're getting a vibe that someone is um, less than truthful or off or is not being fair to the game or the team or something like this or as potentially just not what you would seem as a trustworthy person i would generally trust my gut first and foremost if i really wasn't sure i would obviously have somebody else look at it um again we'll talk about this a little bit more if we have time whereby uh we'd ask around right uh publishers will talk to each other money people will talk to each other uh, everybody has friends, the industry is very small. So if a game was good and the person seemed a little bit off, I would try and check my own biases. Say, hey, is this just me being biased against this person for whatever reason? Could well be, who knows? Um, and if that's not the case, then I would definitely try and get other people to review the pitch, chat to the person, do a little bit of research, all of that kind of stuff. But again, like you're, you're going to be working with these people for years. If there's not a little bit of a connection there, then hey, maybe it's just not meant to be. And that's okay. fine. Okay, the last question about pitching from our attendees. Yeah. Uh, does the pitching process uh, differ in uh, regards to, to, to platforms? For example, is the process different when pitching mobile game, games? Yes, definitely for both. So pitching mobile games is something I hand on heart don't know a great deal about because I only did it once ever. Um, the general ideas of, hey, this is what our game's all about, this is our team, this is our background, all of that kind of stuff, fine. Much more than that, I wouldn't want to say because, hey, I've not done it personally, I haven't received that many mobile pitches, so I don't really know. My gut feeling is, especially if it's for a free-to-play game, we're going to want to see lots of numbers. This is just the hunch here. Your CAC, your user acquisition costs, your uh, revenue per user, your ARPUs, your DARPUs, and all those crazy terms, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, if it's a premium mobile game, I have no idea if it was even exist anymore. I'm not convinced. Uh, I don't know who makes money. I don't know who publishes them. Can't really speak to it. Um, for pitching to platforms like your Sony's and your Xboxes, generally it's the same process again. Uh, the interesting thing there is you very much want to tailor it to the platform you're pitching to. So if you're pitching it to Nintendo, like I went as far as having like make sure the screenshots of people playing the game held Nintendo controllers. When we were demoing it, we were demoing it with Nintendo controllers. Uh, if you were pitching PlayStation, I generally tried to make sure that we were showcasing what our system does well, because hey, we're still in the business of selling hardware and you want their hardware to look good. Uh, hey, this is our game. It uses your PS Move or whatever it is, and it's fantastic. You wouldn't want to, do, and we talk about this later on, like 
you wouldn't want to design your game around a platform feature unless you've spoken to them about it beforehand and it's a very risky thing to do but if a platform has a new shiny bit of hardware that they're wanting to sell hey there's a connect coming out or whatever the future connect might be and you have a game that you would love to make first and foremost that you're super passionate about that you feel would be better by using this piece of hardware then i think it's totally fine to be hey platform you have this cool new piece of hardware i have this game i think we'd be perfect what do you think um and again that pitching platforms is a super weird kind of offset as well because hey there's like the idea xbox program there's like playstation indies uh there are first party second party third party relations people um these companies are huge and the different teams might be looking for different people so again this is one of these things where you want to do a lot of research make sure you're talking to the right person and make sure that you are pitching them something that's appropriate for the platform and all of that kind of stuff as well awesome thanks yeah um yeah so this is this is fun bit uh so we said no uh, you're very sad um so what happens next so this is what i understand today the common mistakes and pitfalls and reasons why people might have said no that they probably won't tell you to your face because they they don't want to make you angry or sad or for whatever reason um and there are so so many of these it's unbelievable uh, the 2020 version of this is essentially your bad zoom call setup they might not say no to you but it doesn't create a good first impression um awful zoom backgrounds and slightly offensive zoom backgrounds which i've had um uh, confederate flag zoom backgrounds in 2020 like regardless of getting into the politics a very contentious issue doesn't necessarily show that you're very up on current affairs a little bit of a red flag who knows uh calling from your bed someone pitched me from mm -hmm. their bed i was like what's up with that hey we're professionals here what's going on uh walking around where we pick up a laptop and take you for a little walk around your garden very disconcerting you want to have a beautiful zoom setup you want to make sure that you are prepared that you've got a nice webcam you're not in a cafe but you're generally good to give a talk it doesn't have to be anything super fancy basically what i hear now is more than enough mm -hmm. um, nobody's going to say no to your game because of all this kind of stuff but it definitely doesn't start you off on the right foot uh, for sure um, but the uh, rules i would say apply also to, to to the publisher to the person you are oh, very much so yeah definitely like you're both yeah. professionals here and you're both looking to enter a partnership and make something great happen right so you also want to make sure 100 percent that they are giving you the good time of day that they're paying attention that they're not on their phone all the time that they're also not walking around that they're also not hung over uh, all of these things here as well that they're not late that you're not late if you turn up 20 minutes late to a half an hour meeting i don't know if i'm going to give you a second chance uh who knows some people do some people don't don't eat a burger during the call somebody did that to me as well don't drink a beer or be drunk beforehand fine afterwards sure but hey at least for the first meeting let's try and keep things professional be prepared make sure all your gifts work make sure you've got backups make sure your mic's on all of that kind of stuff uh, and then during the call as well attitude not being super argumentative or super negative um you might not like what the person is saying you might not agree with them that's fine like just be and don't slag off and don't talk trash about other partners or other people you've been on calls with as well because if hey if you're slagging off sony on a call to me which has happened like yeah, you're probably going to be slagging me off at another call or just generally be creating a bad vibe for yourself or your project or your people is all big no-nos in person as well um again 30 things i hate about your game pitch this is fantastic uh, i absolutely love it it's like the it's like the, the bible of game pitching nowadays and it's super relevant i recommend it um, other reasons publishers may say no regarding more of your game and your project rather than how you pitched it uh for grumpy and their human is a classic mm -hmm. one as well so maybe their wife has just left them or their boyfriend has dumped them maybe their car crashed maybe they're angry with you about something maybe they're angry with a colleague i don't know maybe maybe we dropped their phone it's people are human there's lots of reasons why they may want not want to take your project further and pitch it to the rest of our team um and that's fine uh your game is uh and by the way i should caveat with i basically either ran into all of these myself when i was pitching or found out about them afterwards when i was on the other side and people were pitching to me uh your game is either too indie 
uh, are not indie enough. I've had both of these as well on the same game from very similar publishers. Mm -hmm. uh, doesn't matter what indie is, it's kind of like porn, like you know it when you see it and some people will be like, hey, we want indie games and yours is not it. And some people will be like, hey, we want games that are not incredibly indie and yours is too indie. Uh, mm -hmm. There's not much you can do about it. It's fine. Uh, your game is too commercial or not commercial enough. So it looks like it might make lots of money uh, because it's not very creative or uh, it looks like it might not make any money at all. These are all completely shades of grey situations where nobody is right and wrong um, and it just is what it is. But hey, I've had both mm. of these excuses as well. Uh, your game is either too cheap or too expensive, which blew my mind as well. So if a publisher needs to support your game with a producer, a marketing person um, and a couple of other different people to make it out there, they have to pay for salaries and all of that kind of stuff. And it's just not worth their time spending that money on those people's salaries if your game is super cheap and not expected to make a lot of money. Um, that was unexpected to me, but it's a total thing as well. Uh, your game is too expensive is an obvious word. Hey, you need a million bucks. At the most, we can go up to 500k. Um, uh, your game is either too similar or not similar enough to other games. Yeah, again, it's crazy. So hey, you're making a roguelike game. Sorry, there's already lots of roguelike games out there. Or the flip version is, um, hey, your game's a simulator game. Uh, we don't do simulator games. You should be pitching it to Tesco because they love simulator games and they want more simulator games, basically. Um, again, you'll probably call all of these because you've done your research and you're all super smart people. Um, your game is okay, unremarkable, derivative or boring. Like maybe just what you're pitching isn't that great. Uh, this is kind of a tough one as a creative person. I mean, is what it is, right? Like some people make songs and the songs are not that good. Some people make movies and they're not that good. Some people make games and it's just not that good. Uh, that's just fine. Um, is what it is. Uh, make better games. Uh, your project story is not sexy enough. Yeah, so I had this one as well, which is crazy. Uh, this is a super niche one as well, whereby if you imagine someone was like, hey, I've made um, super successful narrative games and then I started my own company and I made more successful narrative games and now I'm publishing more narrative games. Do you want to give me some money? Ah, yeah, sure. Sounds good. If you're like, hey, I used to make uh, games about guns. I made shooters and I made some more shooters and I started a company and made shooters. Um, but now I'm going to make a free to play mobile casual game. Ah, like not quite a sexy story enough. Like I want to find, I want to fund the guy who made games about space station, who loved alien isolation, made an alien game and is now making another sci-fi game. All right, cool. I'll give that guy some money. That sounds like a sexy story to me. Uh, your do game you, is. Do yep. you uh, like mo most of the answers uh, actually replies an indie can get uh, so far yeah. are pretty vague. But yes. so as a publisher, do you uh, tend to do that, like to to stay in that like gray polite area, or do you decide to disclose as much uh, detail as possible? Uh, yeah, I it's mean, an interesting one. So. Uh, for me personally, I can't speak to any other people on the team, but I generally try and be uh, concise. So straight away, this is a no from us. Uh, I try and give some reasons why, if I can. Um, generally, along the lines of, hey, we're super particular and picky about what we want to fund. This is great, but it's not just for us. I think it's generally applicable to like 95% of pitches. Um, I'll never ever ever get into a dialogue of hey if you've done x differently then we might be interested because mm -hmm. then we're in a conversation then we're in a loop and you're going to come back in three months time and have changed something maybe you change it for the better maybe you change it for the worse like i don't want to be your designer or anything like this or give you false hope so i take it super seriously and try and be very very particular and precise about the feedback and give as much as i can without getting to the point where we're giving like vague, maybe this, maybe if you've done something different, that kind of stuff. Um, again, different publishers will different things here. Some people will just not reply to you at all. Some will give you very detailed feedback. Some will not. I don't know. Some of it's good feedback and some of it's bad feedback as well. Just because they're saying no to you doesn't necessarily mean that their reasons for saying no can will help you get a yes from other people too. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, your game is too bizarre, uh, too bizarre, too bizarre, too weird, too creative, too experimental and not actually a game. So this is another interesting one that's come up as well. Like 
your project feels to be more like an art house art piece rather than an actual money making project for the publisher. So we might say no for that as well, which is fine. And this is also the flip side of it. It's not creative enough too. So super tricky. Uh, your market is too crowded or not crowded enough. Again, this is another variation on the, hey, we've got enough 2D and platformers in the world. We don't need any more. Uh, or the genre is hot, like, oh my God, uh, city builders are blowing up. You're pitching me a city builder. Oh, we don't have a city builder as a publisher. Excellent. Very exciting. So everybody's super happy. Or um, maybe the genre is super cold, like, oh, hey, we're going to pitch you an RTS game. Uh, I don't know. I don't, nobody's really buying RTS games. Nobody really cares about RTS games, uh, regardless if you do or not. I don't really know. Um, but yeah, the genre can be hot or cold um, or crowded or not crowded enough. And all of these can kind of have a thing and an impact on how successful your pitch is. Um, <laughs> yeah, your scope of your budget uh, is wildly wrong. So this is a classic one here. Uh, you're asking for way too much money for the type of game you're making here. So not just too much for the publisher, but hey, you're making like a super small one hour long 2D platformer, but you're asking for $2 million, like crazy. Bad times. Uh, your scope is completely out. Hey, we're going to make 15, uh, 15 kilometer squared open world game with five people and it's all going to be hand crafted and all of that kind of stuff. And we're going to do it in six months. Probably not. Um, again, this is kind of showing your lack of research and your lack of, uh, I don't know, having it figured out this, I guess, is uh, one of the things here. Happens less and less nowadays, but hey, it still happens. Worth to keep an out for. Uh, uh, you compare your game to breakout hits. Hey, we're going to make a 2D platformer. It's going to do as well as Limbo. We're going to make a shooter. It's going to do a super hot. Uh, we're going to make a space strategy game like Astroneer, and it's going to do better than that. Uh, these are diamonds in the rough, unexplained events. These are the black swan things that happen. Uh, you don't necessarily want to compare your game to these kind of games. You want to compare them to other games in your class that have done reasonably well. So you have a sensible, realistic expectation about what you might make. Like, sure, it might become a block out massive success, but maybe it won't as well. So it's good to have some realistic expectations in there. Um, yeah, your team is either too big or too small or not experienced or too experienced. Uh, so I've had people pitch me projects where there are 20 students on the project and it's like guys like the hundred thousand dollars isn't going to feed everybody there what are you thinking about uh, your team is obviously too small can it go to the scope one or it's uh, not experienced enough to deliver or it's too experienced hey we've got 500 years of AAA experience and we want two hundred thousand dollars to do this like, I'm not convinced that the amount of money that you're asking is actually what you need, and I'm not convinced that we are the type of publishers that you need as such an experienced team. Uh, so that's something to think about as well. Uh, and yeah, your team is unlikely to deliver. Uh, I get the vibe, or we get the vibe from your pitch or your demo that we're not convinced you actually have the skills or the talent to ship this out to the end. I haven't really encountered this one too much, but I have heard about it. Um, uh, the publisher has too many games or is too busy. So publishers only have so much bandwidth. They can only release so many games a year. Yeah, the publishers are just filled. Some of the publishers that you pitched to today are already booked out until like 2022, um, which is crazy, but it's a total thing. Releasing games is hard, takes a long time, certification, everything in there. So hey, we might just not have the bandwidth or the time to look at your game as much as we love it. Publisher has no money, also happened as well. Uh, hey, they got $10 million worth of business funding from some VC. They've spent it all. They don't have any cash just now. Not super common, but hey, it's a reason. Uh, also common, they don't know what they want as well. Just because they're a publisher doesn't mean they necessarily have their shit together, for one for a better word. They might not know exactly what they need just now. Their staffing changes behind. They're pivoting to a new direction. Um, doesn't mean your game is bad. It's just they might not know what they want. Um, and that's kind of fine as well. Uh, or the person that you have pitched to who loved your game, uh, like your champion who pitches it to all the other people in the company, uh, has quit. Maybe they got fired. Maybe your entire team has quit, which has happened to me. Uh, or the company just changes its mind for whatever of any of the other previous reasons. Um, that can happen as well. So just because you have someone at your company who loves it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to be around for the entire process of getting it signed and seeing the game come out as well. These people can change. Things happen and do because hey, video games. Uh, so yeah, so almost at the end now, we're just about done. Also worth remembering very quickly, 
publishers talk to each other. So if you're a bit of an asshole, if you uh, are rude or obnoxious or just a horrible person, maybe we'll find out about it. Um, this works both ways as well, true, but it's worth thinking about. Uh, publishers will research you, your team and your company. Yes, definitely. Um, a no now doesn't necessarily mean a no yet later. Doesn't necessarily mean a yes either. Uh, if somebody pitches me something and it's a no, if you want to come back in six months, as long as what we have pitched has changed, then sure, we'll take a look at it again. And maybe it's a yes. Uh, maybe not as well, but hey, it's worth keeping that in mind. Um, and then finally, this is an interesting one. Don't try to pitch what you think that people want. Pitch the change you want to see in the world. So don't try and think about, in my humble opinion here, and this is totally controversial advice, you want to create something and you want to pitch something that you're super passionate about, that you think is going to be fantastic, that you know that players are going to love, that you're going to devote your heart and soul and your life into for a significant period of time. Well, when you start trying to think about, hey, I think this might be a game for Raw Fury, or I know what they want, or I'm pretty sure Paradox like games like this, and we're going to try and make a game that we think that they're going to pitch. Like, down that road is darkness because you will not be happy, in my opinion, in yourself eventually because you'll be making something you're not super excited about. Uh, the person you're pitching it to might not want it. You're left with something that might not be applicable to other people and the whole thing just gets really complicated and all of that kind of stuff. There's a couple of caveats with that. One, platforms, like I was talking about, if you've had a conversation with a platform and they're like, hey, we've got this cool new thing coming out, then, okay, maybe you can pitch something, but that fits that cool new thing, be it a connect or a move or a new console or something like this. But again, it should come from a place of like, hey, we would love to make this thing X because it's fantastic and it also works great with this thing that you're the, this cool doodah for your console for one for a better word. Um, and I think that's totally fine and legitimate and great. Uh, and also as well, this is worth thinking about too, like this is coming from a privileged point of view where you have the time to make something that you care about that you have the time to think creatively about all of these kind of things as well and you want to be creatively fulfilled over a slightly longer term like if you were in a position where you had very little money if you had most to feed in your family all of that kind of stuff like I don't know maybe there is a case where you want to or you just want to get filthy rich totally fine as well I come from a design point of view so I'm all about the creative stuff but hey maybe you're just in it for the money fair play to you uh then maybe you don't want to be doing this and you want to be pitching a different type of project to different type of people. That's fine, there's no wrong or right here. But if you're a creative kind of person and a creative type of company, you want it, in my opinion, for long-term success and happiness, try and pitch projects that keep you creatively happy. Yeah, how important is it to, like, to have creatives in the business, uh, in business departments? Um, oh, that's a good question. I don't really know. Um, it depends, every company is different. Every studio is different, all the creators are different, all the business people are different as well. How has We're, your creative side helped you be a better uh, be a better business developer? Oh, has it? That's the question. Has, I, it? <laughs> has it? I don't know. Uh, I would say it has, mostly because I've been on the side of fence when I'm pitching and I've also been on the side of fence when I'm creating video games. So when somebody comes and pitches me a game, I'll put on my designer's hat some time and I'll be like, actually, I think what you're saying there is like not true or that's not actually going to be fun or that's very risky. I don't think you've thought about the scope. I, I once upon a time made a feature like this myself and I know it took six months. You're playing for two weeks. That kind of stuff from a practicality, from a mindset point of view, I think having worked on a bunch of creative projects, I know that nothing ever happens according to plan and schedule that you've got to be flexible that things change that creative people change their minds and then fundamentally if you're doing creative work in a creative business it's the creative kind of stuff that drives it like it's very hard to make money on a game that's got bad reviews and that people don't actually like it's much more easy to make a lot of money when there's a small number of people or a large number of people who absolutely love your game because you've made a very creatively relevant interesting goods whatever that means create a project so for the types of people i work with now it's super hot then i think it's like a definite benefit if you dropped me into a i don't know a more commercial focused studio or a studio focused on not premium games i would probably struggle and this kind of background i've had would probably be a hindrance because i'd be talking about oh well how does it make you feel and is this exciting for people maybe we should do more play tests rather than like what's our arpu and what's our conversion costs and all that kind of stuff so 
I think that's an interesting one. Final, final slide. Uh, people's friends, networks, contacts are more important than you might think. Again, because this is a human business, uh, 100% all day long, go into it with an open mind of trying to have nice friends, make nice people, make interesting contacts. Don't try and leverage people for what they know or who they know. Just go in there with a nice, in my opinion, friendly, happy, open-minded attitude. And it's a small industry and I feel that that pays off much more than I've seen people try and friend you and then friend you as a link to get to that person, to get an introduction to that person and all of that kind of stuff. It can work, but over the long term, I feel that, hey, like the industry is small, friends are good, everybody talks and trying to go and have a happy, nice, friendly time is great. It's hard when you're pitching for your livelihood of your business. Sure. But hey, like your life is long and your industry is small. So I think thinking about friends is great. Thank you. And that's Al it. That's it. Alistair, thank you so much for your talk today and for sharing all this great uh, advice, uh, your experience and your knowledge with us. I mean, one of the attendees said, like, I have to I have to uh, say this. Like, she said, thank you, Alistair. Great tips. Best talk about pitching in the region. Oh, well, that's lovely to hear. Yeah. That's lovely to, lovely hear. to hear. So thank you so much. I'm sure that all the attendees, including myself, will be rewatching the, the recorded the, uh, 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 yeah, this session when recorded. Thank you so much for 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 everything you have ta ta taught us all today. Thank um, you for having me, and I am very sorry for running late. I feel bad. <laughs> no, it's it's all good. Uh, just another question: like, how can people uh, reach you? Like, through which uh, channels do you uh, are you are you available? Yeah, and sure. Communicate mostly. Um, not Twitter. I'm very bad at Twitter. Email is good for me. It's over on the screen just now. It's just alistair at either alistairhebson.com. If you want to talk to me about personal stuff or you could follow up questions for this presentation or you want the links or any of that kind of stuff, feel free to email me anytime. If it's something kind of business related or hey, you're interested in pitching Superhot Presents, then just alistair at superhotgame.com. Feel free to drop me an email anytime. Again, thank you so much for, for today's talk. Uh, also, I would like to thank all British Council's partners in the West Balkan region who are helping us bring this content to, to you. Uh, remember that in the next couple of days, uh, all of the attendees will receive the recording of this video, um, the presentation and also all the great links uh, Alistair um, uh, shared with us. And also you will get a feedback form and we would greatly appreciate if you would uh, take a couple of minutes uh, uh, of your day to fill out the form and share your uh, feedback about these sessions with us. And we really hope that you enjoyed uh, today's content and um, thank you so much for being with us today and see you in another live session. Bye everyone. Goodbye.